my name is Christian Terboven from RWTH Aachen University and welcome back to our introduction to OpenMP in small bites. Today's topic is titled NUMA Architectures, where NUMA stands for Non-Uniform Memory Access. So before I dive into the details on how to program with OpenMP for NUMA Architectures, I have to explain a little bit more what NUMA Architectures are and how the operating system manages the memory. On the right hand side of this slide, you see a very simple illustration of a, let me call it modern architecture of a compute node. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that we have a system with two sockets illustrated by this set of two cores. Let me tell you, modern systems have more than two cores per socket, but for the sake of a simple figure, I've restricted myself to two cores. So we have two sockets with two cores each, but what makes NUMA uh, of relevance in current architectures is that we have two different kinds of memory. This is wrong, not two different kinds, but two different physical partitions of the memory. This is two times memory of the same kind. So what happens if we have a code like this, where we allocate a large array, let's assume N is of a reasonable size so that A is let's say a couple of megabytes or so in size. When we first call alloc and then second call uh, or execute some kind of initialization. I don't want to dive too much into details of the operating system here, but uh, let me explain it in quite simple words. If you say A equals malloc some certain size, the operating system pretty much does nothing except for making a mental note that this application sooner or later might use a certain amount of virtual memory. So malloc returns an address A, which points, uh, which uh, represents, uh, sorry, which is an address in the virtual memory. The operating system actually has uh, something to do when we do the initialization here. So that means we're going to make use of the address A and start writing data to it. So this is the initialization because otherwise it, the A would have random uh, values. If we write to A at the position zero, uh, we have to map the virtual address to A to a physical address. That means it's an address uh, behind which you can actually find physical memory. So that means we have to find a location either here or there. The operating system manages this mapping of virtual addresses to actual memory locations in so-called pages. So that means there's a mapping not only for uh, not for each single virtual address, but for a certain range. By default, pages on Linux or Windows are four kilobyte in size, but they could also be larger. And in uh, modern Linux kernels, we have a feature that is called transparent huge pages. So based on the memory access pattern, allocations and further details, the operating system might decide to make, make the pages actually quite big, up to a couple of megabytes in size. But let's think of four kilobyte uh, chunks for now. So that means for the first touch, whoops, meaning the first time we are writing to A0, the value of zero, the operating system will create a page put it into the physical memory, and then the application will write to A0, A1, and so forth. At some point, A of N will be um, exceed the page boundary or the capacity of the page. And then the operating system has to create the next page, put it into virtual memory, and so forth, until the whole array A is covered, assuming that A is completely initialized. Yeah? So malloc is only making a mental note yeah, pre, uh, preparing a mapping from virtual addresses to physical addresses and only in the initialization actually data is allocated and placed in the physical memory so if we have a system like depicted here on the right where we have two different physical locations of the memory how does the operating system decide where to actually place those pages by default Operating systems like Linux and to some extent Windows and Mac OS, although they call it differently, employ a strategy that is called first touch. So the location 
of the page is decided when the first touch to the memory behind that page is being uh, performed or happens. And this is exactly what we do during the initialization. So this is when the decision is made. Now, what is the decision? Um, by default, the operating system will, play page, will place the page as close as possible to the thread or process or to the core on which the thread or process is running that performs the first touch. So in my assumption here, yeah, this is this NUMA node where uh, if the initialization thread or process is running here. So these physical memory partitions is what we call NUMA nodes, non-uniform memory access nodes, because if a thread is running here and accesses data that is located in this NUMA node, then the memory bandwidth is higher and the latency is lower than if the thread running here would have to access the data via the interconnect if it is placed on a remote NOMA node. So in how far is this an uh, OpenMP topic? Well, accessing uh, data on a NUMA node has performance implications, as we will see later on. And that means on NUMA systems, and here I use the term CC NUMA for cache coherent, C, cache coherent NUMA. With that, I would like to refer to the discussion on uh, fault sharing. So um, the memory access on NUMA systems has performance implications and dealing with that is important uh, for parallel applications that are running on NUMA systems. Because if you do it in a kind of wrong way or not the optimal way, that means if there's a lot of remote memory accesses, bandwidth is reduced, latency is increased with a consequence on the application performance being reduced, at least in most cases. At first sight, OpenMP does not provide explicit support for dealing with NUMA architecture. So this is why we have to understand how the operating system behaves and we're going to exploit that understanding later on. Because the operating system is responsible to actually place the pages within the physical memory. In consequence, to some extent, the behavior of a parallel OpenMP program on a NUMA system is then depending on the version, the settings, and the capabilities of the operating system. And in order to address these shortcomings, OpenMP version 5, uh, released in 2018, introduced what we call the set of feature under the term memory management. With that, you can have fine-grained operating system and architecture independent control about how data is being placed within a NUMA node. However, this is uh, only available in um, beta or test implementation that are not the topic of this um, presentation. So let's come back to this. Yeah, now I've uh, drawn a white bubble to denote where the thread is running. And if the thread is running on this particular code and performs a serial initialization, as I explained two slides ago, then all the data, that's what I'm trying to illustrate here, will be allocated on the NUMA node as close as possible to the uh, thread, yeah, which is a local NUMA node. If the local NUMA node would already be fully um, uh, used by all the data, so that means if A is larger than the local NUMA node, for example, then the operating system would also make use of the other NUMA node. If we parallelize the initialization, assuming that we have one thread on at least one core per NUMA node or possibly on each core, then the operating still performs the first touch, but because these first touch accesses now are being performed from different cores, possibly with different distances to the different NUMA nodes, with that um, we can then distribute the error A over the two different memory partitions. So two initialization threads are running here and they're responsible for the first set of pages that represent A to be allocated over here. Two other threads are being uh, executed over there. In consequence, some pages of A are allocated and physically placed over there. We still have shared memory. There's only one A 
And if you, in your program, reason about A and deal with A, you're working with virtual addresses. The mapping of virtual addresses to physical addresses happens on the level of the operating system. So this is completely transparent to you as a programmer. And this is why we can distribute array A over two physical partitions of the memory. You're dealing with logical memory. There's A, one array, and in the physical memory, we have two partitions, or even more on current systems. When is NUMA relevant? At least when you have two or more sockets, you have two or more NUMA domains, but modern processors sometimes have even uh, already two NUMA nodes, even in a single socket system, because we have two or more memory controllers per processor. One important question and assumption in dealing uh, with exploiting the first touch policy of the operating system is that we have to bind the threads. And this is what I will explain on the following uh, slides. But first, let me give you some pointers if you want to understand the topology of the system on which you are working. Uh, you, should, uh, you can query the current system, but in particular, you should query the topology of the system that you are targeting. There are a couple of tools for that. I've just selected two tools. One is Intel's CPU info tool that comes with Intel MPI. The module switch command works on our cluster, but there should be something similar on the cluster that you are working with. And if you execute CPU info, it will deliver information about the number of sockets, Intel calls those packages, the mapping of processor IDs to the sockets and so on and so forth. Why is this of relevance? For example, if you think about binding, and the, um, you have to understand where are the cores 0 and 1. Are there neighboring cores on the single processor? Are there cores on two different processors? And this depends on, again, settings of the operating system. This is something that CPU Info will tell you, yeah, but don't get me wrong, when you work with OpenMP, you will work with some kind of abstractions that will hide these details from you. If you work with OpenMPI, you will encounter or you will have uh, the HW log library and tools available. And there's a tool, for example, LS Topo or HW log LS, which will display either a graphical representation or again a command line based representation of the topology of the memory of the system that you're working on. Again, you will also get information about which core share caches, how large are the caches, and so forth. Now you have to decide for a binding strategy. If you have understood the system topology and if you have two or more threads, you might decide, do I want the two threads to put closely together or far apart? What does that mean? Far apart would mean you would run two threads on two different sockets. If you have two or more sockets in the system, putting threads close together would mean you would put them on two adjacent cores which possibly share caches. There's no universal right or wrong in doing so, but there are performance implications which, as so often, depend on your application. If you put threads closely together, this is a second case on my slide here, then they share a lot of resources. They might share caches, L1, L2, L3 cache and so forth. They might share the connection from the processor to the local main memory. And that means in total you have less, let me call it just hardware available, smaller caches, less memory bandwidth. So if your application would profit from large caches and uh, high memory bandwidth, that might not be the right choice. However, if you run two threads which share a cache, synchronization constructs often deliver a higher performance because for example, if, you, if they uh, both work with the same log, the underlying log variable could reside in the cache that is shared. And then it can travel faster between the cores than it would have to travel between two sockets. The other option, putting threads far apart, means if you have two threads, for example, you can run them on two different sockets. You could profit from the two, um, from the aggregated cache sizes, for example, two L3 caches. You could profit from the aggregated memory bandwidth of two sockets and so forth. However, then fine-grained synchronization constructs might come at a slightly higher overhead. So if you don't know what is the right for your application, you could just try a few options and then select the one that's working best for you. How can we implement the binding in OpenMP? 
version of uh, version 4 of OpenMP introduced so-called places and binding policies. Places is an abstraction of the hardware architecture. So it makes the uh, enumeration of cores and the mapping of these core IDs to actual hardware locations transparent to you as a programmer. This is the level of the system and the granularity at which you're reasoning about the binding of threads. More details in a couple of seconds. And then we have thread affinity policies, spread, close and master, and some more that you will see, um, uh, and spread, close and master. Yeah. And um, spread performs what I just explained, spreading threads more or less evenly about the places, meaning spread the threads far apart. While close puts them closely together, close to the master thread, but not necessarily on the same core. Whereas master co-locates all the threads in an OpenMP parallel region on the location of the master thread. So we have places as an abstraction of the system topology or architecture, and we have thread affinity policies to bind the threads of an OpenMP parallel region, not to specific cores, but to places, which is something in OpenMP and in consequence makes it vendor and architecture neutral. Let's assume the following machine topology to illustrate first what an OpenMP place is. So we have two green boxes, which I intend to represent two sockets. Then we have four kind of bluish boxes per socket, which I intend to represent four cores. And then we have four white bubbles per bluish box, which I intend to represent four hyperthreads per core. Two times four times four is the number of logical threads that an operating system would report as um, yeah, logical cores, whatever you might want to name it, available in the machine. The OpenMP places, place list is an enumeration of the places, meaning the location, to which we can bind OpenMP threads, and uh, it's defined by making use of the OMP underscore places environment variables. In most cases, you will set it to an abstract name, and the abstract names that are available uh, are shown here on the slides. Let me start with OMP places equals sockets. Yeah. This would create a place list with only two sockets, uh, with only two places, one per socket. And then mean we could only define if we want to bind the thread to the left or the right place uh, socket or the first or the second socket, whatever you might want to name them. Cores would result in eight places, one per core in the machine architecture that I illustrated. And then threads would result in 32 places. So it basically gives defines the granularity at which we perform the binding. The default in almost all implementations is OMP places equals cores. If we bind a thread to an OpenMP place, it will be allowed to roam within the place. And this is why the granularity is important. If we just want to make sure that the thread is on a specific socket, then OMP places equals sockets might be okay. And then the thread can roam freely within the cores and hyper threads per core. If we set it to cores, the thread can only roam within the core, but over the four hyper threads. OpenMP version 5.1 to be released in November 2020 will introduce the abstract names LL caches, which represent um, places containing all the cores that share the same last level cache, and NUMA domains, which represent all the cores that are grouped together and form a NUMA domain in the sense uh, that I described it later on. That means respecting uh, or grouping together cores with the same bandwidth and latency to a given physical memory location. Now, if we have places, we can perform the thread binding. There's the OMP underscore proc underscore bind environment variable with, uh, that you can set to either spread, close, or in special cases, master or if you want to have more fine grain control per parallel region, you can use the proc underscore bind clause with either the argument spread or close and put it onto a parallel region. I have a very simple example here where uh, we set OMP places equals cores. And what I'm trying to say here is uh, 
that there's also another way of defining the place list. So we can use regular expression to define the sets of logical cores that then constitute the OpenMP places. If you want to do experiments on a system, if you want to do benchmarking and so on, then this is good. But in most application cases, you will work with the abstract names. So in my example here, I'm using two different uh, parallel regions that are nested. And my assumption is that here on the first level, I'm making use of an OpenMP parallel region within my user code. And on the second level, I might exploit some parallelism within, um, for example, a library. Yeah, the first level could uh, define something like the domain decomposition, while the second level could then be a parallel solution of linear equation system or something like that. Both parallel regions are started with four threads each. So that means in total, the program will execute with four times four equals 16 threads. And on the outer level, I will use a spread policy. And on the inner level, I will use a closed policy. If OpenMP thread binding is enabled, for example, by setting any prop bind, um, uh, the uh, OMP prop bind environment variable to any value, then the master thread or initial thread, that's the right terminology, will be executed on place zero. It will be bound there as soon as the OpenMP runtime has been started up. At the encountering of the first parallel region, four threads will be executed, uh, will be um, will be executing the parallel region. So three threads will be spawned, three worker threads. And then the threads will be evenly spread among the places in the system. If we have eight places, four threads, yeah, the solution is shown here on the slide. Now there's an important thing that I try to capture in my slide. Yeah, I partition the place list. Here now P is uh, trying to represent the places. So the spread Binding policy not only spreads the threads evenly among the places, it also partitions the place list. So here, this thread will see eight places because we have set OMP places equal cores. And then here, each thread will see the place list to consist only of two places. This is because spread in many cases is used to support nested parallelism. So now we are calling the second parallel region here with a closed strategy just for illustration purposes, yeah, which might be in a parallel library or something like that. And then the four threads are spread, uh, sorry, are not spread, are put closely together. We have only two places, that means two threads have to run per place, yeah, but they are executed on different places because we have decided against master. And thread zero and one will be um, on place zero, uh, play, uh, place two in this example, and uh, place uh, threads two and three will be executed on place three. And of course, we also have uh, the thread going on uh, here, and uh, the threads doing the same here and there. Yeah, I just didn't show it for the sake of keeping the figure readable. So what we have learned in OpenMP and in the, uh, uh, what we have learned with respect to OpenMP and NUMA in this video is that we can bind the threads and then perform a parallel initialization to exploit to the distribution of data over NUMA domains. What's the influence on performance? So I have a measurement from a slightly or rather old machine by now, but it uh, it's a very nice measurement because it illustrates that with exploiting NUMA in the right way, you will get an increased memory bandwidth per NUMA domain. On modern systems, there are so many effects so that you can see it that sharply in many cases, but uh, probably for a simple benchmark like stream, it's also possible. So if we double the number of NUMA nodes within our architecture, in theory, we double the aggregated memory bandwidth if we use thread binding and parallel initialization. So what we are seeing here, I'm making use of the simple stream benchmark here only the vector assignments. We have two vectors A and B and B is copied into A or vice versa. The vectors are large, for example, 300 megabytes per vector. And if we measure the time of the copying and do it in parallel, yeah, we can exploit the distribution of data over NUMA nodes. And if we then measure the time, we can actually compute the rate 
uh, which is in the memory bandwidth. And in many cases, stream vector assignment and the other stream operations can be used to measure the peak memory bandwidth of the system. So I have five variants plotted here. So uh, blue and gray is a serial initialization, green and um, uh, yellow is a numa aware initialization and sorry, uh, orange is also a serial initialization. And we see that with a serial initialization, we hardly profit from NUMA. Why is that? Because all the arrays, A and B or whatever, reside only on a single NUMA node. This is because on this particular system, the interconnect between the NUMA nodes was quite limited. If we do the NUMA aware initialization, yeah, with the different binding strategies, we sooner or later start to profit from NUMA. Sooner means if we use a spread strategy because there are already two threads are executed on two different NUMA nodes. And with the close NUMA strategy, uh, the first threads only start to appear on the second NUMA node as soon as the first one is filled up. Yeah? So it was a Westmere processor with uh, 12 logical cores per socket. Quite old, as I said. What is the difference or what do we see here? Well. Uh, let's just call this uh, 10 gigabyte per second. Uh, and here we are in a sequential mode. And uh, if we use enough threads, we get 20 gigabyte per second on a single node. This is the maximum bandwidth of a single socket. If we then exploit NUMA on two sockets, we get something like 40 gigabyte per second. So as I said, the numbers fit pretty nicely if we make them to fit. Yeah, uh, And uh, we get um, the uh, we can increase the aggregated memory bandwidth by a factor of two by using two, the memory of two different NUMA nodes. That was my explanation of NUMA architectures and OpenMP.